but the connection may be even closer. Gordon notes the striking fact that the old system of the millet, the old ethnic system, we can't go into to that here, uh, is preserved today only by the Greeks and the Hebrews, and that the Greeks and the Hebrews are the only people that survive from the ancient world, and the Greek and the Hebrew languages are the only languages that survive from that time. And they're actually very close. Greek and Hebrew civilizations, he concludes, are parallel structures built upon the same eastern Mediterranean foundation. They are the only survivors of the ancient order. It was the records of Ugarit that provided the clues showing how Achaeans, Trojans, Philistines, the Philistines, remember, were Greeks, uh, and Hebrews, from whom Palestine is named, during the second millennium belonged to the same international complex of people. Unquote. What Gordon tries to show in his new book is not blood relationship, but common cultural and religious heritage. What the Hebrews found and took over when they came to ha Canaan was essentially the same Mesopotamian law that the Greeks got through Crete. The Greek epics of Homer, Hesiod, and the Heraclean cycle are prehistoric Babylonian Gilgamesh epic, very closely connected, which in turn has so much in common with Genesis. Old Testament sacrifice has close technical analogies with Homeric sacrifice. We're given many instances here. Minos has rightly been compared with Moses, who received the law on the mountain. The, um, the themes of the uh, Pentateuch are shown on the, field, on the shield of Achilles, some people think. Homer depicting of kingship is the best, Gordon says, Homer's depicting of kingship is the best possible information for understanding the early Hebrew kingship. The traditions about Greek prophets, especially Tiresias, are of prime interest for their biblical parallels. He was a real prophet. The world of Homer is the world of David and Samson. After all, the Philistines, Israel's closest neighbors in the beginning, were Greeks and never left the scene. They stayed there. It was with the help of Philistine mercenaries, as Pigot notes, that da King David was able to establish himself on the throne of Judah. He didn't get the support, remember, from the tribes. His army was Philistine, David's. Heichelheim has shown that Ezra's Palestine had a surprisingly close tie with Periclean Athens. Dor on the Palestinian coast near, near the Haifa. This is the airport of Jerusalem. And right up there in the time of Nehemiah was an Attic city, was an Athenian colony up there, right in the midst of the, Is of the Israelis. And uh, that was the city of Dor. The... Greek carpenters, Greek shipbuilders, sailors, and mercenaries built the great Phoenician and Egyptian fleets in the time of Lehi, and almost a thousand years before, Mycenaeans were entrenched on Cyprus and had intensive trade relationships with Syria and Palestine. The recent excavation of Hazor, it's the biggest ancient city in Palestine, in Israel, is Hazor, and the Israelis, Yadin, have been uh, excavating it. And what do they find? It's practically a Greek city from way back, from be before the time that the... Uh, Hebrews moved in there. It was Mycenaean. It was Minoan there, and it's just full of this stuff. C Cypriot ware, Mycenaean ware of the late Bronze Age in the city of Hazor. The Jews moved in and lived on there with the Greeks. The Phoenicians, early Egyptians, Sumerians, Akkadian traditions, fused from the beginning, and from the beginning, David... Uh, uh, David and Solomon went to the Phoenicians to be fitted culturally. But in the 8th century, it was the Greeks who took over the Phoenician cities. And these ties are enduring. Philo, the greatest Jewish philosopher, was a Phoenician from Byblos, while Zenon and Boethius, the two greatest Christian philosophers, were both Phoenicians. The New Testament, Gunkel notes, is actually a Greek book, and yet at the same time it's a peculiarly and intimately Jewish. How could it be both? The two traditions were really quite close. The study of the earliest Jewish archaeology has produced things which quite amaze one familiar with the accepted traditions of Judaism, we're quoting, since they show the early Jews completely Greek in their expressions. The old Jewish testament of Job doesn't hesitate to depict Job's three daughters as the equivalent of the graces and give them Greek names. More striking is the appearance recently of a number of studies dealing with the common ancestry of the Jews and Spartans. This is an interesting thing, that they actually were, that the Jews were, uh, well, it's perhaps not without significance that the Greeks of the Pindus Mountains, that is, all of central Greece, north-central Greece, all through the Middle Ages were not members of the Greek Orthodox Church, but observed the traditions and practices of the Jewish sectaries of the desert and called themselves Josephites. No wonder the Greeks, oh, that should be a wonderful field when it opens up. But they weren't Orthodox. They were Josephites all through the Middle Ages. After all, the closest neighbors of the Jews in modern times have always been the Arabs. 
Ever since Sir Robert Wood's studies in the 18th century, it's been fashionable to describe Abraham and other patriarchs as noble and rather primitive sheikhs of the desert. They did, not move, uh, they did move around a good deal in the desert, but what is desert now was largely cultivated and even forested land in those days. While their mobility brought these men into constant contact with all the civilization and sophistication of their time, it also preserved them from being absorbed by these. Uh, actually, we don't find real Bedouin Arabs in the Old Testament at all. They're first mentioned in 853 and by Nehemiah. They're mentioned in the time of Nehemiah. What meets us in patriarchal times is, as Edward Meyer observed, rather the dwellers of the transitional areas between the desert and the town. The patriarchs he describes as being, as being half nomadic. See, we're just, we're just warming up. This is just section one, so don't be discouraged. We'll get to our subject. Turn to section two here. Well, well, this goes on. The primitive people about the Amorites and so forth and how they're related. Anyway, the Arabs were not the original. They've been there all the time, and uh, there was they had much in common, but there's always been a very fundamental difference between them. On the other hand, Hebrew relationships with Persia are quite close, and we go into this here at some point, because you know the connections. There's hardly an element in the old Persian religion. See, the Persians seem to have had an inside track on the gospel. They have all sorts of things, which doesn't turn up in other ancient religions whose records are older, but this is the point. It doesn't originate with the Persians. They just assimilate this stuff. There is hardly also a thing which doesn't meet us again in the apocryphal literature of the Jews and Christians in a form indicating more or less close association with Iran. The demonology, the doctrine of angels, the resurrection, the asceticism, the war between light and darkness, the incarnate word, the pre-existence and return to the heavenly home, the heavenly glory with God, the King of Kings, baptism, the pessimistic view of this life, the miracles, the martyrs, the prophecies, the apocalyptic visions, the secrets, the signs, the mysteries. Each of these elements is at home in the Iranian religion. They had all that stuff, see? Uh, but you find it older among their neighbors. We don't know where they got it from or how long they had it. The prehistoric Persian year right was equated by Gressman to the Christian Easter. The influence of Zoroaster is found to impregnate the philosophy of the Greeks and uh, Neoplatonism and the Christian Massive Iranian influence has been discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls and hence in all the closely related writings of the pseudo-Clementines. Molin notes how the movement represented by Qumran community branches out to embrace Judaism, the swarming Baptist sects of the time, the Ebionites, Islam, and finally conventional Christianity. So it goes down the line. And here, tracing it, it's being traced clear back to Elam now. And the Mandeans, they're... Uh, they're another group. Well, the best thing to do, I suppose, would be just to talk about these things, these Mandeans. And there is a straight line. Well, here's a quotation from somebody who ought to know. George Widdengren. In fact, he is the best authority on this today. He concludes, there is a straight line that leads from the old royal rites of Mesopotamia going back to seals 5,000, 6,000 years old right down to Mandean baptism. He says, the baptism of the Mandeans who baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost in, in the running water they were a very interesting sect of Andrews. This shows you what goes on. A few of them survived down here, about 2,000. But they say they came from Palestine, and they say they came from the very same place where the Dead Sea Scrolls people came. When Jerusalem fell, first of all, they'd been driven out in the desert because by the wicked Jews at Jerusalem to preserve the gospel in its purity. They're connected with uh, Jonadab ben Rechab who fled from Jerusalem just before Lehi did, for the same reason Lehi did. And he preserved his people pure and intact in the desert, as Lehi intended to. And he settled out there. And his descendants are still going on there. But no one would believe that they were Jews because all their doctrines and their practices were so Christian. But now we know they're genuine old Jewish practices. And this is the sort of Judaism that Lehi took out of Jerusalem with him, the kind you find in the Book of Mormon not the kind you find in the Old Testament, which has been very carefully edited and expurgated by the rabbis later on. They took all these elements out. Now we're finding this out today because of these older documents being discovered. And another interesting thing, of course, is the way Islam is coming into the picture. Well, um, it's hard for us to believe today that not many years ago the Bible was regarded by higher critics and fundamentalists alike as a singularly isolated book. The Mormon scriptures 
presented what purported to be a type of early Judaism which resembled not only Christianity but betrayed elements of other ancient religious traditions as well. There's so much Iranian, so much Persian stuff in the Book of Mormon, for example. And depicted singular universality of outlook and mixture of cultures and blood in Judah of 600 B.C. Remember, only half the names of the Book of Mormon are Hebrew names. The other half are Egyptian with a scattering, a couple of Greek names and a few Hittite names and a lot of Arabic names, good Arabic names, all this mixture. Nobody knew anything about that then. They thought the Bible was one book. Now this is the picture we get. All this shocked and scandalized intelligent Christians of the 19th and early 20th centuries. The Egyptologist J. Peters protested that the Pearl of Great Price, for example, displays an amusing ignorance by which Chaldeans and Egyptians are hopelessly mixed together, he says, although they are as dissimilar and remote in language, religion, locality, as today are the Americans and the Chinese. As late as 1916, they could say that the Egyptians and the Babylonians, and the Chaldeans, that's southern Babylonia later, or northern, either one, uh, it's used by de Morgan for all of prehistoric Mesopotamia. He always calls it Chaldea. But... Uh, they could actually say that. The Pearl of Great Price is crazy because it has Egyptians and Chaldeans together. I mean, you have this, the same cults, the same religions. The, the priests of Ur have their ideas presented in, in uh, Egyptian cryptograms explained by Abraham. Now, this is crazy. You have, imagine, as late as 1916, they had, his, had no more connection, culture, language, background than the uh, modern Americans and the Chinese. And now today, it wasn't long before Moray came along and he actually argued, and so did Albright, that uh, Naram Sin was actually Menes, that the king of the first dynasty in Egypt was actually a great king of Mesopotamia, the same king, and that Egypt was often, we know now, definitely, it's not disputed at all, that the first two dynasties, the so-called finite period, Egypt was under Chaldean rule. But nobody ever knew, nobody knew that as late as 1960. See how everything's fusing together now. Everything's running into everything else. As late as the 1920s, so eminent a scholar as T.E. Peat could insist that the accumulating points of resemblance between the literatures of Babylonia, Egypt, Greece, and Palestine was a pure coincidence. They had nothing whatever to do with each other. There was no contact whatever between those civilizations. Well, how silly when today we can walk from one to the other without any trouble and you can fly over them. And, uh, well, of course, it's embarrassing because they're so close together. They're stepping on each other's toes today. I mean, uh, militarily, it's a very dangerous situation. Today, however, we're being told, there's a quotation from Albright. He says, The Bible strikes root into every ancient Near Eastern culture. It cannot be historically understood until we see it in its relationships to its source in true perspective. The Hurrian, Hittite, Sumerian, Ugaritic, Akkadian must all be taken into consideration, while on the one hand we now see the Old Testament instead of a uniform surface, a variegated world of widely differing literary documents and authors. See, the Old Testament itself has broken up, and yet it's become unified as never before. This is a strange thing. It's a, it's a double play. The uh, process is both centrifugal and centripetal. The Bible reaches out to all these cultures and draws them together in a single complex here. While a short time ago, uh, for along with increasing awareness of its own variety and complexity, which a short time ago ended up in almost complete fragmentation of the Bible in the hands of the higher critics, comes the growing awareness of the essential unity and wonderful consistency of the Scriptures. It's now realized that Israel was no more isolated in her language than she was in her religion and culture, that Hebrew is heir to a large common stock of Semitic words and borrows freely from other languages. That's a quotation. The net result is not to undermine the unity and originality of Hebrew, but rather to explain it. The tremendous new world recovered by archaeology and philology, writes, uh, philological research, writes Albright, underlies and undergirds the Bible. To understand it, flexibility and willingness to change one's own ideas are both absolutely essential. One of the things most powerfully brought home by post-war archaeology is, quote, the essential uniformity of the earliest civilizations. Just as one of the first results of prehistoric studies was awareness of strong impression of the essential uniformity of prehistoric cultures throughout the world. The essential uniformity of later civilizations, that's the last step today, was first indicated by the studies of comparative literature and folklore. The scholars who pointed out numerous and striking parallels in medieval European, Greek, Indian, Chinese, and Arabic literature were at a loss to explain why they should all be telling the same stories. 
Until the missing texts are found, I'm quoting one here, any explanation can only be the purest speculation. But the missing texts were forthcoming. They were found. For example, we can now fill in the once gaping emptiness between the remarkable par remarkably parallel wisdom literatures of the Jews, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, showing, quote, uh, I think this is Lambert, that all three collections form parts of a cosmopolitan whole. The mantic sciences of the Babylonians, the Chinese, and the ancient Etruscans. How widely scattered they are. The Etruscans way over there in Italy, the Chinese way over here, and the Babylonians have the same peculiar mantic practices. That is divination by liver and all that sort of thing. Um, how do you explain that? Well, they're now being connected up. The, the gaps are being closed. The recent discovery of a Megari, Megaranian type, a Megarian type of Greek vase, a very early and religiously significant object in Vietnam, is now explained as reflecting a common prehistoric, imagine fa finding a prehistoric Greek pottery in Vietnam. What next? They didn't bring it there, you understand. I have slowly been forced to suspect, Professor Goodenough confesses, that the spiritual history of the development of Western man cannot be written as a series of disjunctive essays, an essay on the religion of Babylon, on the religion of Egypt, on the religion and so forth and so on, up to the present. He says that won't work anymore. He says he has slowly been forced to come to this conclusion. Rather, it must be seen to be a continuous adaption of certain basic symbols. The dominant motive today in the world picture is that of continuity. There is a general Zusammenhang, as Kerst says, every uh, hanging together, in which the historical element comes to life in the web of lively interchanges. This universal historic outlook is in direct opposition to our formal classical concepts of history of only a few years ago. Unquote. Hebrew prophecy, we are now told, grew out of a background of ancient Near Eastern prophecy going back very far and spreading widely. Everything in the Old Testament has, as Schofield observes, substantial analogies among other people. Everything in the Old Testament has analogies among other people. But when we go to those other people, we find that all their stuff has substantial analogies to their neighbors, too. A good example is Egypt. Years ago, the Orientalist Ellis noted that the custom of naming people and things and peculiar practices of heraldry were the same in England as in Egypt. Well, the early and yet from that very same period, what do we find? Well, is that an accident? He explains it as an, a, a striking example of the unity of man. Man is the same everywhere, therefore spontaneously he'll develop these cultures spontaneously. Today we know that isn't so at all. Man does nothing like that spontaneously. Because, but when Stonehenge can be dated at 1450 to 1250 B.C. by Egyptian beads, they've now dated Stonehenge by the Egyptian beads found at Stonehenge, not made in Egypt at uh, not made at Stonehenge, but made in Egypt. So now we know the, the age of the rites there of the 14th, 15th centuries B.C. We begin to suspect the connection may be something more than a common biological and psychological background. It seems strange today that the really close ties between prehistoric Egypt and early Sumer, which are now taken for granted by everyone, they were practically the same uh, people, should have been doubted and discredited for so many years. Nothing appears more obvious today. One is reminded of the long controversy that raged, and we have it here in the library, that raged among the philologists in the pages of antiquity, that's the name of the journal, as to whether English and German were related languages. Now, anyone here would think that's absurd. Of course they're related. The word man, house, any, anything you're going to talk about, they're practically the same thing. Oh, no. No, sir, they wouldn't accept that. The scholars said that's, that's too easy, that's too obvious. Uh, as to whether English and German were related language. With typically conservative British, British scholars stoutly denying any but the purely fortuitous resemblance between the two languages. That is purely accidental. Just as today they can still deny the connection between Greek and Minoan script B. Today the prehistoric story of the contest between Horus and Seth in Egypt is recognized in the rites of the Sumerians, the Hittites, the pre-Hellenic Greeks by Monte, the greatest archaeologist in that field, who actually hyphenates Sumero-Hittites. He says the Sumerians, these people, he likes to hyphenate Sumero-Hittites here. So this makes our relatives, the Hittites, connected with the first people to use writing the oldest, along with Egypt, the oldest civilization in the world. Nobody knows where they came from. We might mention here that for years conservative scholars denied that there ever were any Sumerians or that there was a distinctive Sumerian language. It took years to prove to them that that was so. 
In fact, it would seem that conservative scholarship is equally enthusiastic in denying relationships between ancient peoples and denying their individuality. First, they deny that there are distinctive Sumerians, Hittites, or pre-Hellenic Greeks. They've done that all in our generation. And then they deny that they were closely tied to any other people. The longest and most stubborn denial was the connection between Babylonia and Egypt, which, as we've seen, scandalized critics of the Pearl of Great Price as late as 1916. But Egypt was not only aware of the existence of Babylonian, a Phoenician and Minoan civilizations in the beginning, but her merchants and priests were quite at home in those lands. The early Sumerian epics written in the Aramean cuneiform, not in Egyptian, were first found in a great library in Upper Egypt, in pure Akkadian, northern Mesopotamian dialect, um, in another library in Central Asia Minor also, along with a Hittite translation. If the Syriac Acts of Thomas speak exactly like the Book of the Dead and the prehistoric Egyptian pyramid text, that's no accident, we learned today, for the Memphite theology can be traced in an unbroken line we mentioned before, right down. The Greek theater is now held to be of Egyptian origin and the depth and uh, great age of Greek dependence on Egypt for spiritual scientific help becomes more apparent every day. Okay, let's get that. The... Uh, when we read in the De Anima of Aristotle, of the four souls, writes Cyrus Gordon, we are dealing with the Aristotelian development of the basic Eastern Mediterranean concept whose intimacy is already attested in the pyramid texts of the third millennium B.C. Long ago, Sir Flinders Petrie made the surprising statement, we are the heirs of Egypt rather than Hebraism in our Christian ideas. He based this conclusion on the fact that conventional Christianity has come through the minds of the doctors of the University of Alexandria a strongly Egyptianized institution. Greek thinkers classified the wise men of Egypt with the wise men of India and visited them both. The discovery in the, of the old Sumerian era epic has shown that the institution of the traveling wise man and teacher, as well as holy man, the traveling bard and scholar, goes right back to the dawn of history. Now, this is a thing. From the earliest times in all these civilizations, people traveled. Prophets and bards and merchants all the time and teachers and scholars and they would travel from one great university to another. What? When? As early as we can go back. The, the nine earliest records we get from Mesopotamia, the earliest production we have, the earliest writing we get from Egypt were produced in schools. And these schools were visited by traveling scholars from distant lands. So they were exchanging these ideas, these concepts all the time. They would give sermons in each other's temples and they preached a single gospel everywhere you went. It soon became soon became it was always that way as far as we can see the for from prehistoric times the great cult centers were also schools of international fame they played no small part in producing that surprising state of uniformity that characterized all the old religious writing and cult practice no matter where they come from the mobility of religious personnel such as prophets explains the spread of religious teachings and institutions it's a quotation the original impulse to see the origin of a biblical element in whatever ancient non-biblical writing the same element occur has long since been discredited. Today, nobody sees detailed parallelism. That's when a thing occurs in the Bible and you find it somewhere else, it doesn't mean the Bible got it off there. The Bible is just as old. The Bible has just as much priority as anybody here. But how do we account for this then? Nobody today sees parallels between the religion of Christ and the cult of Marduk, Anton Mortgat points out. No one today would derive the Easter story from the Persian year right, as Gressman did, or denounce as Gnostic the numerous statements of biblical and patristic writing, which also do appear in Gnostic works, largely pirated. On the other hand, it's a rare scholar today who would deny the reality of those resemblances. The resemblances are real, they're not accidental. They are all preaching the same sort of thing and they're no longer attributed to mere coincidence. To explain their significance is at present the major prospect of biblical studies, the major program project. When H.J. Sheps affirms the, that primitive Christianity, the Ebionites, the Muslims, and the Catholics are equally legitimate witnesses and proponents of the message of Jesus, he is offering an interpretation of the phenomenon the overlapping of all these with each other and the sharing of common basic teachings. But how do they all come to share the same ideas? One mechanism we've just mentioned, the traveling prophets, teachers, and so forth. Another is the migration of the sectarians. 
When Jerusalem fell, the sectaries of the Dead Sea, along with others, scattered all over the Near East, just like the Jews. The Jews aren't the only people who have undergone the diaspora. You see, the Jews, in all in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because Abraham, they were scattered. Again and again they were scattered throughout the whole world. You find they're, uh, they're in the most unlikely places, and there they are. Well, this has continued, and other people have had the same thing happen. Other nations have been scattered too. So it means everybody's mingled with everybody else. It's this constant stirring. If you stir the colors or the soup or whatever it is enough, you're going to get a uniform substance, aren't you? And this is exactly what happened. So we get the migration of sectarians. The sectaries of the Dead Sea, there's a good example. Moving individually and in groups to Egypt, to Persia, anywhere they can find safely, and then on as businessmen, as travelers, visiting their relatives, coming back and forth, moving just as much then as they do today. It has been recently found from the study of name lists that the Jews living in Egypt were exclusively from northern Mesopotamia, in Roman times were exclusively from northern Mesopotamia and Syria. The excavations at Dura have shown in a single street, this is from the early centuries of our era, uh, half a dozen different churches. One uh, street is very interesting. This is Dura from the second and first centuries. This is from around 250. Along the street, six different churches of different religions, including Christian, a Jewish synagogue, uh, Zoroastrian. There were all sorts of churches together there. Side by side, they knew each other's ideas. The members lived side by side in the little city and inevitably exchanged ideas. Altheim shows that Muhammad is conscious successor of Mani as the bringer of a world religion. The world religion idea has always been at home. That's not a new thing. Uh, when someone like the, the Baha'i come out and say, we now have the idea has grown to the idea of a world consciousness. There has always been the world religion in the Near East. That's not a new idea at all, any more than the moral law is a new discovery or was discovered by Amos or the prophets. That's been there all the time. The basic idea of these religions, as the man says, you don't read in the Rash Shamra fragments about uh, the god of Ugarit or the god of Tyre. It's the god of the whole world. And it's so in Egypt. Ammon rules all men, all animals, all flesh. And it's the same in Babylonia. Bar Marduk rules all men. He is the father and the shepherd of all men. And this is so in the earliest religious records we find everywhere we go. It's not that man's ideas evolved religiously to a higher plane till they drew in the wider concept of things. That's the old evolutionary concept. And uh, it's no good. Uh, the... Uh, there remains, well, blending with those ideas, Zarathustra, well, universalism is no late invention or astounding insight. It runs through the Egyptian and Babylonian texts from the beginning, as Gordon noted, it's characteristic of the early Canaanitic literature as well. From the beginning, Zeus is the father of gods and men and not just of the Greeks. What then remains unique to the Jews and Christians? What is theirs then if everything belongs to everybody? Their nearness to the source. They're nearer to the source than anybody else. That is what they always insist on in arguing with their neighbors, and surprisingly enough, the neighbors had no answer. Every people puts its own stamp on the common heritage, and where the gospel is concerned, the stamp is just as important as the heritage. The Jews and the early Christians were loud in their insistence that the rest of the world was in outer darkness by its own will and choice, that it had the traditions and it knew about them, and it had the opportunity to accept them but had rejected them. So it's not surprising we find them there. Uh, having deliberately chosen to follow the ways of darkness that would exclude them from a knowledge of the light, that the light had been brought to them all uh, and all but thrust upon them time and again, not only brought to them but thrust on them the light was, you see, not only, only to receive their emphatic rejection. The strange thing is that the testimony of Israel's neighbors actually bear this out. You read... We have these same ideas, we've said, among all these people we've been mentioning. But when we ask them, well, where did you get your religion from? Is it the true religion? What do you know about it? They always give you the same answer. We don't know. We don't know where it came from, and we're not very sure that it's the, the straight thing. But it's different, you see, with the Jews and the Christians. Conventional Christianity has always rested its case on certain basic assumptions. First, that Christianity is an absolutely unique and original religion that there are no inspired writings outside the Bible, all else being the work of mere men or depraved impostors, that one possesses the complete gospel in the Bible or else nothing, nothing at all of the gospel, that since all that is not Christian is pagan and all that is pagan is abominable, any further information that is to be obtained, another point, 
is to be got only through official interpretation of given material and not by revelation or by new discoveries, either one. This is basic to Christianity. And of course, against this concept, the Latter-day Saints place the constantly reiterated statement of the Book of Mormon that God speaks to more than one people, nay, that he speaks to all people as well as they are, as they are able to hear him, that there are prophets we dream not of, that the Lord himself has visited nations completely beyond our ken. No people is completely without the gospel, Brigham Young used to say, and no people has the complete gospel. We have the pearl of great price, conveying God's mysteries in the idiom of Egyptian cryptogram. We have the first leaders of the church acknowledging the divine inspiration of a Mohammed. We have venerable chiefs and wise men of the societies of Indians, the islanders of the sea, and so forth, called primitive, leading their people toward the gospel by dreams and prophecies, many stories of that. If the Old and New Testament concepts, teachings, stories, and even idioms turn up in the religious literature of various ancient societies more and more, that simply confirms the Mormon position. Students everywhere have leapt to the conclusion that the presence of the flood story and the Garden of Eden motifs in ancient records of many people discredits the Bible by showing it to be just another primitive presentation of old myths. What it discredits, however, is their concept of what the Bible should be, a unique, perfect, absolutely complete, flawless source of all knowledge, a thing which the Bible itself never claims for a moment. There is more than one possible explanation of the common elements of religion of Israel and her neighbors, extending even to distant places. If it is possible that the Jews drink in with the traditions and follies of their neighbors, quote the Book of Mormon, as their own prophets often accuse them of doing, we, we do have them being corrupted by their neighbors often. It's also possible that other people beside the Jews possess some of the truth. True, their versions are never just like the biblical ones and are sometimes patently fantastic. But why not? Since everyone agrees that all ancient traditions have been to some degree altered and contaminated, or as the Doctrine and Covenant says, section 91, there are many things therein which are interpolations by the hands of man. You wouldn't expect to find the same uniform story everywhere, but the same themes you do find. It's precisely with regard to their traditions of the creation and the fall that the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Babylonians are most frank to confess their uncertainty. They have some knowledge of the same traditions we meet in the Bible, but they disqualify themselves as competitors with Israel. They do not compete with Israel. They disqualify themselves. Uh, take the, the pyramid text, for example. This morning I went through some of these. And I opened at random, and it was at the 17th chapter. And how many times does this occur? I made a quick translation here. It'll show her. I'm not going. It's, it's the 17th chapter here. After a man is died and buried, his spirit goes to the underworld and rests in a pleasant place. And that's what he's doing here for a period of time. And this discusses that. And it shows a good knowledge, you see, of things. But what do the Egyptians know about it? Um... It is good to recite, it starts out here, right here. It is good to recite this while you're still upon the earth, for then all the words of Adam come to pass. No, the word they use is atom here, which the great French scholar Alexander Moray showed to be the word Adam, our friend Adam, our, our parent, the same one, Tim, the first ancestor he's talked about here, uh, come to pass. I am the God Adam in rising. I am the only one. I came into existence in the other world. I am Ray, who rose in the beginning, the ruler of this creation. Use the word expressly, the ruler of this creation. This is Ray, when at the beginning he rose at the city of Heracleopolis as a king for his coronation. See, they celebrate it there. The pillars and supports of the world had not yet been created. It was in the pre-existence. I am the great God who created himself in the other world, who made his names to come forth in the company of the gods in the beginning. Then there comes a questionnaire. Who is this? This is Adam, in his, written in his atom disk. But others say it is Ray when he rises on the eastern horizon. He is yesterday. I know I am yesterday and I know today. Who is this? Yesterday is Osiris and today is Ray. When he overthrows the enemy of the Lord of all space, when they fought in the heavens in the beginning, when he established his son Horus to be the prince and the ruler. But others say that today is Ray during the festival which we celebrate here, of the meeting of the dead Osiris with his father Ray, and when the battle of the gods was fought in which Osiris, the lord of Amenti, was the leader. Osiris represents Christ within the that. What is this? Question is asked. 
those of Amenti, the creation of the spirit world of the gods, when Osiris was leader in Setamentit. But others say that it is the Amenti which Re has given to me. I know the god who dwells in it. Who is this? It is Osiris. But others, however, say that it is his name is Re. I am the Benu bird who is in On. I am the keeper of the volume of the books of the things which have been and the things which will be made. Who is this? It is Osiris. Others say it is the dead person himself. Others say it is the dead body of Osiris. And yet others say it is the excrement of Osiris, the physical world. Others say these things have been made, uh, that these things been made are eternity and that things which shall be made are everlastingness, and that eternity is today, and everlastingness is the night. Well, you see the point. Here's a very early text. This text was actually penned, well, not very early, seven, around 1700 B.C., but of a much older text. We have versions of this text well over a thousand years older than that, so it's very old. But you notice they don't know what it's about. Some say it might be this, it might be that. You notice the two things that appear here. All these show remarkable knowledge of a single tradition, but they're at a loss to explain that tradition. Well, what does the Pearl of Great Price say? Pharaoh was blessed, remember, as to the kingship and was a good man, but cursed as to the priesthood. He didn't have the authority or the knowledge. But they have these traditions, and they're genuine. They go back, obviously. They're not made up independently by a hundred different races and people. They're much too complex and much too uniform. And they're always the same. You're always going to get this same picture. Now, if we turn to Babylonian religion, take the collection of Lambert here. We made Lambert has recently connect, collected, this is called the Babylonian wisdom literature. These are the statements by the most holy and righteous of the Babylonians. And these were good men who sought to righteousness, and yet did they have any hope? Did they understand their doctrine? They have a wonderful description of the creation and the fall and the Garden of Eden and the ark and all that. They know all these stories, but as he says about them here, um, the universal incidence of death seemed another injustice since the ancient Mesopotamians looked for no rewards or bliss in the afterlife. The gods lived forever, why not man? The old Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh is written about this topic. Several Sumerian Gilgamesh stories were taken, one of which the Gilgamesh in the land of the living describes how he was tormented by the thought of death and conceived a desire to achieve immortal fame by some outstanding deed. But there is never any hope in this. Um... The, here is what he's told when he goes to find out about the resurrection and about life hereafter. The answer, Gilgamesh, where are you rushing? The life which you seek you will not find. For when the gods created mankind, they assigned death to men. They kept life in their keeping. As for you yourself, Gilgamesh, fill your belly day and night. Be happy every day at pleasure. See? Nothing to live for. Day and night, dance and rejoice. Put on clean clothes. Wash your head and bathe in water. Gaze on the little one who holds your hand. Let your spouse be happy in your bosom. This philosophy has not one word about religion, writes Lambert. They don't understand. See, they have these traditions. They know these, but they don't know the gospel. They don't uh, see where the reality of it comes in. He says, uh, yes, not one word about religion. And it's a moderate hedonism. Mankind, now here, is an illustration. Mankind is deaf and knows nothing. What knowledge has anyone at all? He knows not whether he's done any good, a good or an evil deed. Where is the wise man who has not transgressed and committed an abomination? Where is he who has checked himself and not backslided? Who is there who has checked himself and has not done an abomination? People do not know what's to be done. A god reveals what is fair and what is foul. He who has his god, his sins are warded off. He who has no god, his iniquities are many. Then he goes, this is the writer of the Ludlul, the most famous Babylonian theological hymn. He goes beyond the view that a man can only learn right and wrong by divine revelation and asserts that man can never distinguish good and bad because the gods are so remote. All this they have lost connection with. You see. And revelation is out. We, that's the only way we should know, but he says no. It's all too far away. And this theme runs through all of these. The writer of the Ludlul, he says, advances this theory without enthusiasm and turns away in despair. No solution seemed adequate. And this is so with every single Babylonian writing. They had a wealth of information, but they were completely and wholly pessimists. They had nothing to look forward to at all. Then we come to, let's say, take the most pious of all Greek writers. I think I brought Pindar along. Pindar is the most holy of all the Greek writers. 
And he starts out saying here in the, for his first ode, the beginning of his first ode. Now he says some marvelous things here. He has these traditions, but he doesn't know where they come from. Listen to what he says in his introduction here. The world is, the world is full of marvelous things, he says, a thumb and a puller. And uh, men start talking about those things and change traditions to the strangest ways. And he says, as soon as men start using mortal discussion and talking about the true gospel, he uses the word ton the true logos. When men start talking about the true logos, he says, before you know it, they have decked it out and so changed it with the, their own mistakes, with their own corruptions, with their own pseudosipoikilois, with the devious and various devices and inventions, that exapaton uh, timithoi, that they end up as deceptive myths. You notice these things aren't myths. A myth is something somebody invents to explain uh, something that's happened. It could be ritual. It's mostly ritual or a historical event. You invent a myth. But these themes are never invented. Nobody invents them. We've never discovered anyone inventing them. They borrow them from other people. You don't borrow myths. You invent myths. See? Well, these are not myths. But he says men start working on these themes and they change them around until they make them myths. He says deceptive myths. And then he says an interesting thing. The gift of poetry and speech, he says, has such a, a peculiar and charming effect that he says it actually possesses the power to make true things seem false. Plato used the same expression, things. And false things seem true. And this is often the case, he says. How do we know which of these traditions he's going to talk about is true and which isn't? He doesn't know. See, he just doesn't know. They, they've been so larded over and changed by human tradition, so many interpolations by the hands of men, along with many things therein which are true and mostly translated correctly. 91st section says there are these interpolations, and so he doesn't know. And this is exactly why Plato says we cannot allow Homer to be taught in our school. Not because Homer isn't inspired. Homer is inspired, but he's not consistent. He says we can't tell when he's inspired and when he isn't. We have nothing to go by. We have no revelation today. We don't know. So, Homer, so Plato's best advice was leave it alone. We can't use it because we don't know. Well, this is the difference between these people and Israel. They do have the same legends. They do tell the same stories, you see. But Israel stays right on the track, and these other people are not only off the track, but they admit it. They admit that these are divine, that, these, that this is the old tradition. They don't know how to evaluate it. They don't know what to make of it. And another good example would be... Ovid. Now, Ovid's metamorphosis, you'd swear, here's the Latin poet, the Latin pagan poet, you see, writing for the emperor, and he, uh, you'd swear he got the whole thing right out of the Bible, right straight out of the Bible, but he doesn't. He talks about uh, the earth being organized and so forth, but when he talks about the authority of what he's saying here, um, well, this is right out here, Garden of Eden, and then the fall of man, but when he talks about his authority... Um, I should have marked that. These things. Oh yes, it starts out. Sicubi dispositam quis quis fuit illa deorum. Whoever it was of the gods that did this, if there was a god at the creation, he says. And um, then he says, um, oh, he's talking about Noah after the flood. Now repopulating the earth, the very receiving the covenant again. And uh, here's an interesting thing. Do you know who it was that was sent to give the covenant and the sign to Noah? According to him, it was called Deucalion, was Iris. Well, what is Iris? That's the rainbow. Well, in the Old Testament, Noah sees the rainbow. See, there's Iris. He, as if he was taking it right out of there. Um, but where he talks about... They am receiving the covenant here. Oh, here's one. He says, they, now, the story of Noah, then he tells a peculiar story, a fantastic tale of how Noah and his wife, in order to repopulate the earth in the shortest possible time, threw stones over their shoulders, and some of these stones became people. That was the way they planted the earth. Now, he puts in parenthesis after that, quis ho credit, who, who would ever believe this if we didn't have the testimony of great antiquities who support it? I never would believe it, he said, if it wasn't a very ancient tradition. He doesn't know what to go by. But you see these things do, be, do become corrupted, and yet you could see the same story there. Well, I see that the time is up, but I want to take up the...
very interesting Mandean document down here, the Chaste Brethren of Basra. That has so much. This is a, a remarkable document because of the, at the time, this, they got out of, in the ninth century, they got out an encyclopedia. They show astounding knowledge of things. They knew more, so much more than people did later on. There's just no comparison. There's one long essay here on the germ theory. It just explains the germs of various diseases and so forth beautifully and all about it. But um, when this starts out, it's the same sort of thing. And again, they're very much perplexed about their sources. This, this whole first part is about the war in heaven and so forth. This is the translation I did this morning. And uh, what we're supposed to do about it and how the rights and the ordinances have been lost. Well, are there any questions? <laughs> Since the time's up, we might as well break it up. We're supposed to start in the middle for, to have a rest, but uh, you all would have gone home and gone to bed then very sensibly, so we just kept talking. Oh. The first pl prophet was Enoch. Yes, excuse me. Yeah, he talks about germs as the cause of disease. Oh, these, they call themselves the, the pure or the genuine. It's translated... They, the Safa, they call themselves Safa, enlightened, the enlightened brethren of Basra. This was a sort of monastic group. It was a colony living down here, closely connected with the Mandeans. They're supposed to be Muslims, but according to this, they're not very much. And they wrote a great encyclopedia in the 10th century in which they explained all knowledge. And they have some marvelous things. And in this book, which happens to be on animal life, they have a wonderful discourse on how little uh, invisible animals, so small they can't be seen, but of various types and with lots of legs and so forth, are responsible for certain ills and diseases that uh, attack the human system. In other words, the germs. Uh, and, uh, but the introduction here, of course, this, uh, this Mandean writing. Yeah, here, all this is about the, the germ theory here. But you see now what's happening? Everybody, we're all one big happy family. But that doesn't mean that the gospel isn't the gospel and that it, you can just find it anywhere. This means you can go out and join any church or join any particular group. But it means that all people should be eligible for the gospel. They're coming closer and closer together all the time. And this that was taken as evidence, you see, that the gospel was a fraud because we find these same things among other ancient people actually substantiates it from our point of view. This is exactly what the, the big thing that shocked people when Joseph Smith came along. All this new stuff, he broke it wide open. He broke all the old, uh, broke down all the old fences of the Bible. Here was another holy book came out, written by people beyond the sea nobody had ever heard of. In fact, we've never located the, uh, the Nephites or Lamanites to this day. It was a small community they lost somewhere, you know. And then talking about the Lord coming to other people and then coming out with Egyptian writings of Abraham and about Joseph and so forth and Moses and uh, all this was very shocking to people. The whole concept of the Bible, that that wasn't complete, that didn't have everything in it. And then here we have going out and one of the first projects was to go out and preach to the Indians, other people, some of the islands of the sea. Yes, Brother uh, We didn't pick up any records. Oh, you try to pick up records there. You've had it. They won't let you pick them up. No, but they, uh, we've uh, they've secured some things, some very valuable objects, I think more valuable than the records as a result of that. They'll be showing up pretty soon. They'll be in Salt Lake, not here. And uh, no, they'll, they'll go from Jordan to Salt Lake and they'll stay in Salt Lake. Hmm? They're not records? I haven't seen them. I didn't get to see them, so I don't know what they are. They're, uh, but they're interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, they're more valuable than the records, actually, because there are fragments of records around. Four universities in this country have portions of them. I mean, a little scrap of them. You can, the photographs are more valuable than that, as far as that goes. But the stuff that goes with them, the jars in which they came, we're getting some of those. Well, everybody knew they were there. Everybody knew they were there. Whether they're important to the church, I don't know. But they're, even if they're not, they're so darn cheap. We got a marvelous deal, so we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> sure, they don't. 
You need to worry about that. No, they, nobody else could have got them, I assure you. Nobody else could have got them. They wouldn't have sold them to anybody else. They were sold only on condition that they should end up in the museum up on Temple Square. It comes some Jordanese had been very much impressed by that museum, that place up there, and they wanted them there. It's sort of a mecca up here. See, they realized we had a holy center too, and there's, they knew of no other such place in the Western world. And they think that would be a marvelous place to have uh, their st some of their stuff on display. Um, but they're acquiring it, and it'd be good, it'd be good stuff. Well, they're doing most of the disclosing. They're doing most of the disclosing. But they've been very strongly immunized, I know. They've been taking shots for years. Most people have. So this stuff won't affect... It gradually sinks in, though. It gradually soaks in. No, they, uh, they're more hospitable all the time, uh, reluctantly and steadily, but they're approachable, I mean, this, as far as that goes. No, these things are leading to certain conclusions. The, the mo people most alarmed by this have been the Catholics, of course, because they place so much stock by what they call the originality of Christianity. This is the original religion. There can't have been anybody preaching like Christ before Christ. It, it began with a shepherd singing in the field before that. And that's when their church began and so forth. And they could have no rites and ordinances like a sacrament or baptism before the time of Christ. That's unheard of. The Book of Mormon's full of it, see? Very shocking sort of thing. And now it's because of these Dead Sea Scrolls that lowered the bars and... And they've come in with a rush. Now, I might as well admit they're there because there they are. And the Jews admit it now. The well, the, the only person who studied that is Professor Kraling at Yale. He studied that a lot. And he, he noticed the phenomenon that uh, in all the old records, including in the Bible, when, when Noah lands after the flood, he doesn't know where he is. He is lost. He's in a completely strange land. So if he had ended up in Mesopotamia where he began, he wouldn't have been lost with the same landmarks around, the same distant mountains and so forth. Uh, but he was in a completely strange land, and the only way he was able to locate himself was by a special revelation. He had to have his location revealed to him. There he found himself again. Of course, in this, uh, in this uh, Deucalion story, he finds himself on Parlesis, the one we just read, the the one that uh, Ovid is writing about, he finds himself on another mountain, a big high mountain in Greece, various mountains. They, these ancient people have different mountains. you know. But they all tell that he floated a long ways and was very far from home, so he couldn't have just been lifted up and then put gently back uh, on the table again after the flood. So this led Kraling to look for the original source in Africa. It must have been very distant, he said, in Central Africa, and then he gave that up. And then he looks far to the east, because they say Eden was at the east. You see, it was all back at the east. So he's suggesting last at the last count, I think something in the East Indies or back there. But the idea now is that uh, the Garden of Eden was not in Mesopotamia. It was far, far to the east somewhere, see. Um, maybe even off the continent. Could have been. But things were so changed by the violent uh, storms and so forth. Yes, brother. Well, we're going to talk about that later. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it's still being criticized. Yes, there is indeed. They're less than a year old. Sure, there's new stuff comes out all the time. Yeah. yeah, we're going to talk about that later on. You know, that'll get you really confused. But, uh, no, there's, there's quite a bit, and it, it deserves to be considered. After all, it deserves to be taken up. We were going to talk about that here, you see, originally. We are going to talk about that. And then they told we changed. No, that was in the other series. And then I had to go away. Otherwise, I would have given that pearl of great price to him. On the uh, in uh, in May, it's going to be in May. On the critics of the pearl of great price, yeah. the yes here and the contemporary critics. It's in this. It's in some series or other. Uh, yeah. I thought it was in this one, but it isn't. Well, they not by his name, no. Well, you always, you always have the, uh, he's very important. You always have the Savior, the Messiah, who comes in, in here. We, we could read that. And Marduk, who offers to give his life. The plan, the plan that requires that a redemption be made. Yeah, that's a motif. That's always in. That's very important, the sacrifice. 
This is one of the things that first dedica- discredited Christianity. Here's the very same thing among the Persians. The very same teaching they have. And it is. It is the same teaching they had. It. They didn't know what it was, and they confess they don't know what it is. See? That's the difference. Yes? About Melchizedek? Well, of course, a lot of, with the new studies, the reopening of the whole study of apocryphal writing, the whole Melchizedek question is thrown wide open now. Melchizedek is becoming a figure of prime importance in connection, especially in connection with the priesthood, too, because uh, he's the father of the line of Zadok. See, his name, Mel- Melchizedek, is the righteous king or the, the king of righteousness or the the righteous rule or something like that. So the same element, Zadok, and he was the father of the Zadokites, according to some traditions, whom David put in in charge. The Zadokites and the Dead Sea Scrolls are always specified as the priests. There must be priests. The Zadokite must be a priest. The priests who have kept the covenant, who have remained true to the covenant, they are Zadokites. And there was a lot of fighting about, about that. A Melchizedek? Coming in, the, oh well, there's a uh, there's very good writing on on Melchizedek and Abraham as far as that goes. But uh, you mean how he got the priesthood through the line of the fathers? No. Oh well, that's the big problem. That's the big question. The best the best explanation, of course, is in the that he was a king of uh, Salem. That he was a priest king of Salem. See, we don't know who was occupying Salem in that uh, in those days. The first king we run into is this fellow in the. In the um, Amarna tablets, he's the king of Jerusalem, writing desperate letters to Egypt to rush to his help. And then these sons of Laban let the Hebrews into the town, and that's the last we hear of him. We see everything collapsing. And for, as I say, for a long time, people said, that can't possibly be the Hebrews, but it turned out it was the Hebrews. But still, they, ha- they haven't got the picture fitted together again because they're there too early. Uh, the Hebrews shouldn't have come out. They shouldn't have left Egypt yet. <coughs> But now we know that Hebrews were wandering bands. It, it's, a, it's a class of people and it covers a very large area. And uh, this is acknowledged by everybody now, namely that when the Israelites, Israelites, yes, they were sons of Jacob already, went into Egypt, they didn't all go. Some of them still stayed back in, behind in Palestine. They had cousins back in Palestine the whole time they went back and joined them. This is recognized by, in his last book, Albright, gives quite a thing on that. He says they left their, their other people back there and they went and joined them. These are the people we read about in the Amarna tablets where they go back and take. But uh, the figure of Melchizedek still eludes us, but the type is now beginning to emerge. He was a priest king. He did have the authority. He was not an Israelite necessarily. He didn't have to be. Uh, but he could have been, you see, from, from another line. He could have been... He had these dealings with Abraham could have been related with him. What's, there's one thing where they intermarry, but well, that's another story. Yeah. The families. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you have that too. Yes, you get, well, even Ovid here. Ovid says, I'll give you another advan- I'll give you another version. Well, I, don't want to. I see the time is up now, and you're all very tired. And, uh, but he says, I can give you another version if that uh, won't, uh, if that isn't adequate. Well, he talks about man in the pre-existence. He says, either... Um, where is that? Oh, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Um, but man was the most sacred animal of all, superior to all others in mind and intellect and power to dominate. And he was chosen. And then he says, either he was, according to one theory of divine descent, recently come down to earth and let down as the last of the creation to occupy the earth, or else, um, and, and retained in himself for the first... Uh, of the of divine seed, and then he says, being directly descended from Japheth. It's interesting that all these writings can trace it back as far as Japheth and no further. He traces it back not to Adam, he says it's Japheth. Japheth was the first man. 
Iapetus, he calls him here. And the same thing, the Greek writers all say that the first ancestor of the human race after the flood was Japheth. They don't mention, well, Deucalion, but Japheth is their ancestor. He's the one from whom all true people descend. So again, this is a biblical name. They, they all use the same name. And he says there's that theory, or else there's this other theory um, that man simply rose out of the primordial ooze and slime. And then he goes through the various degrees, first as fishes, then as serpents, then as creeping things, then as birds. See, and this is, this is an ancient idea. This is not the, the result of modern scientific speculation. This has been handed down from ages, this idea of an alternate theory of evolution he gives us. From the primordial ooze, he says, heated by the sun where the shallow water was, teeming with, the, with smelly stuff and so forth, out of that came this life. Well, this is what they've been telling us. And then he gives us the stages that came first, he says, as little animals, wiggly things, fish, and then the others. So you have this alternate theory right from the beginning. The Babylonians had that one too. That, again, I say, is not a discovery of, of modern science. You have the two. Well, here, Brother Cowan, you better come to the rescue of these poor people.